Well, let's see here. I might not be Morgan Freeman, but this is... Classic Gamer Reviews. 2015 is shaping up to be a big year for movies. In June, we have a new Jurassic Park, and in December, a new Star Wars. Two franchises that are great on their own, but I believe would be even better if combined. All joking aside, with the success of these movies, there have been a whole bunch of video game releases. For Star Wars alone, there's been well over 80 games that pretty much span across every console ever made. And while we usually see Star Wars games once or twice every year, Jurassic Park games are in a whole different ballpark. Or should I say, Dinosaur Park, eh? Eh? No? Uh. Jurassic Park games were mainly being made in the mid to late 90s, and as such, a lot of them were for Nintendo systems. The majority of them were made by Ocean Software, who was well known at the time for making licensed games. You may know them though as the people who made the cult classic Dennis the Menace for the Super Nintendo, or Waterworld for the Virtual Boy. Everybody loved that. Just kidding, no one did. Ocean's first Jurassic Park game came to us in the form of a top-down shooter for the NES, appropriately called Jurassic Park. The game starts off by shoving Ocean's logo in your face in such a way that makes the game look broken. And then, with dramatic music, cuts to a rise in T-Rex. Once the T-Rex opens its mouth, however, upbeat and lighthearted music starts playing, which really disrupts the creepy tone that they were trying to establish only a few moments ago. Despite this, however, it's a clever enough menu screen, especially on a system with so many bland title screens. The game itself, as I said, is a top-down shooter in which you control Alan Grant through six levels as you try to rescue Tim and Lex so you can ultimately escape from Jurassic Park. Because apparently getting eaten by a T-Rex isn't the children's idea of a good time. Are we having fun yet? In order to beat each level, you'll have to complete various tasks, with the one consistent thing throughout each level being collecting eggs. It's worth mentioning that, although this came out the same month as the film, that the game has more in common with the book than it actually does with the movie. In fact, a lot of the games have more in common with the book than the film. That's not to say there aren't similarities between the two, but you'll be doing a lot of stuff in the games that happen in the book such as visiting the raptor nest and interacting with the NB. Visiting all the varied locations of the book, though, works to the game's favor, since, despite coming out near the end of the console's lifespan, a lot of effort seems to have been put into the graphics of this game. The bright and vibrant colors of the park really make the environments look and feel like a lush jungle. However, the pretty looking graphics just seem to hide at what its core is just an average game. That's not to say I didn't have fun with the game, but there's certainly a lot that could have been improved. To many, the most glaring issue in the game comes in the form of these mystery boxes. They are scattered throughout each level, and when picked up, can inflict a wide number of effects on you, ranging from giving you health, to more often than not, just exploding in your face. Why these are included in the game is beyond me. I mean, I've never read the book, so I could be wrong, but I don't think anywhere in it does it say, and then Alan Grant picked up a box, and it exploded in his face, and he died. The end. Despite the fact that there's a question mark on the box, what's inside isn't actually random, as it's the same item each time, meaning that if you want to know for a fact what's in each box, then you need to use trial and error and keep note of which boxes are good and which are bad. Now, taking down notes in a game wasn't too foreign of an idea back then, Tons of PC games required it, as well as some Nintendo games. The original Metroid didn't actually have a map, so making your own on pen and paper was pretty much essential. Or you could use a pencil and paper. I won't judge ya! But there was a reason for that, as that game heavily emphasized exploration. But here, you shouldn't have to take notes on anything. If the boxes just had an icon to say what they do, it would remove a lot of unneeded frustration from this already difficult game. It also doesn't help the game's difficulty that the game is really picky with its ammo. This wouldn't be a problem if your character shot directly in front of himself, but he does so at the side, so unless if you're in the right position, 
a lot of your bullets will miss entirely and you'll just be wasting ammo. If you could strafe, this may have been a bit easier, but no such option exists, so instead, you're forced to take extra time to adjust yourself, which usually results in you getting hit. Though, the lack of strafing is understandable considering the small amount of buttons available on the NES, so I won't be too hard on it. When you do kill an enemy, they will only drop ammo for your basic weapon, and you only get the amount that it would normally take to kill them using the basic weapon. So if you're up against something that takes 4 hits to kill, but you only have 4 shots left and you miss, then you're screwed. The best thing to do is to use the other weapon to collect the basic ammo dead enemies drop, so you can just hoard it. But with a few more tweaks to the game, or even adding something as simple as having more ammo lying around, the game would have fared much better. The game does shake things up by adding a couple boss fights against a T-Rex, which are a bit hard, since you also have to protect the kids who don't seem too bothered by the whole situation. I mean, they spend half the boss fight just waving at the T-Rex. Mr. Dinosaur, come eat me! There's also a couple parts in which you must dodge Stampede and Triceratops. In the first of these sections, you have to protect him at the same time, but it's difficult because he travels directly behind you, and because of that, he'll usually get trampled. Pretty much anything involving kids in this game is painful and annoying, so at least in that aspect, the game's a little bit realistic. Overall, it's not one thing that brings Jurassic Park for the Nintendo down, but a whole list of small annoying things, some of which could have easily been fixed. But even if they were, there's just not enough in this game to make this more than just your average shooter. In the end, not a bad game, but you certainly could do better. On the handheld side of things, a port was released only a couple months later on the Game Boy. Only a couple months later on the Game Boy. The game remains pretty much the same as its NES counterpart, with only a few changes here and there, though graphically, minus the color, the game looks the same. But seeing as how this is a port of the NES version and you just saw that review, it's only worth mentioning what this game does differently, as most things from the other review still apply here. One of the more apparent changes in this version is the fact that the screen size is different from the NES game. This makes finding the eggs a lot more difficult, because they were placed in accordance to the other game, which gave you a bit more viewing room, and seeing as how the game revolves around collecting eggs, it can become a pretty big issue. But the overall biggest difference to the Game Boy game is that it changes the first T-Rex fight, and removes the second Triceratops stampede and last boss from the game entirely. Well, I mean, right before the last screen, there is this box that damages you, so I guess that could be the last boss. Oh my god! Oh! Instead of fighting the T-Rex, the game has a pretty neat part in which you have to run away from him. What makes this cool though is the fact that the T-Rex's vision is based off of movement, and so if you stop moving when the T-Rex is looking at Lex, then you won't get bitten. Let the T-Rex see you though, and he won't stop chasing you until he either bites you or you shoot him enough times. But seeing as how the game doesn't give you ammo at this part, I would just delay the inevitable for as long as possible. Get the fuck away from me! However, the more I tried this section, the more I started to hate it. Sure, this is a really cool and innovative idea, particularly for a Game Boy game, but this part is just way too hard. One of the issues I ran into was with Lex, as she kept bumping into rocks, so even though I was able to get to the end of the level, I'd have to go back to get her, because while she has no problem dodging a T-Rex, she'll completely fall apart if, God forbid, she runs into a boulder. Just as broken as Lex is the AI for the raptors, whereas in the NES version, the raptors were actually dangerous and would chase you. Here, they just kind of wander around and are more of a slight inconvenience than any real threat. In fact, the boulders actually posed more of a threat than them. As a neat little bonus, the game also tells you about the dinosaurs you're encountering in the game and would give you fun facts about them, like here. The Triceratops, despite a fearsome appearance. Oh God, help me are really quite docile. I want to see my family again. I'm having so much fun. Yeah, docile. Jurassic Park for the Game Boy stands as a decent enough port of an average game, even if at times it can be a bit frustrating. Like the NES game, it's nothing absolutely amazing, but it passes the time and there's some fun to be had.
Not one to let extinct creatures remain dead, Ocean released another Jurassic Park game only a couple months later. This time for the Super Nintendo, and it was called, you guessed it, Jurassic Park. A lot of people will say this is just a remake of the NES version, and from first glance I can see why, as they are both nearly identical in terms of starting location and at least for the top-down parts, gameplay. You also play as Alan Grant, even though at one point you have to find his ID card, why he doesn't have it on him, I don't know. But instead of being separated into different levels like the NES version, this game takes place in one big overworld. That and the fact that you switch from a top-down view into a first-person view in many parts of the game separated enough from the NES version. As a kid, this was actually the only Jurassic Park game I ever played, and to be honest, I had a lot of fun with it back in the day. Years later, the game only scares me now because of how cryptic and frustrating it is. It's painful for me to bash a game that I had a lot of fun with when I was younger because of nostalgia, but as a kid, I just had fun exploring the game's big world. But playing it now with the intent to beat it and not just wander around, there's just too many problems to overlook. But let's start with the biggest. An essential part to beat in any game is, well, actually completing it. And typically, with longer games, some sort of feature will exist that allows you to continue if you want to play later. Do you see where I'm going with this? You can't save the game. That's incredibly fucking stupid. Sure, in the other Jurassic Park games, you couldn't save, but there were at least cheat codes to allow you to skip levels and return to where you left off. But here, there's no such thing. And this is a huge issue, seeing as how there's a lot to do in this game. What could have been a fun game completed in short bursts was dragged out in, for me, a five hour monotonous journey. When you force the player to beat a game in one sitting, it can make even the slightest repetitiveness turn into something incredibly boring. It also makes any problems your game has become more apparent. At least the game gives you the benefit of unlimited continues, but having a save feature would have been much better. While they did leave out the ability to save, they did add a lot of small things to the game that are actually really creative. If you've read the book or seen the movie, then you should be familiar with the character of Dennis Nedry, who sabotages the park and is overall just an asshole. Well, in the game, he's still an asshole, and he'll give the character advice that if you actually followed, would get you killed. Which I think is actually pretty clever of the developers to add to the game. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you have the characters who actually aren't trying to get you killed, but end up doing so anyway. Do not shoot the gla... The glam... The gla... Fuck it. Do not shoot the Galapagos. They may stampede. What the fuck do you mean they may stampede? I didn't shoot any of them and they're still doing it. Well, you know what lying to me gets ya? A bunch of dead Galapagos. You happy, you asshole? Whether it's giving you cryptic information or just taking up half the screen, pretty much none of the advice you get is actually useful or anything more than annoying as hell. But on the positive side, at least this doesn't happen in any other games. Hey, gorgeous, jump in. Let's go somewhere where the busy buddies can't see us, sugar. Aside from Nidri's humorous bits, another clever thing that the game does that I've always enjoyed are the unconscious raptors. Some weapons will only knock out raptors, and as such, if given time, the raptors will wake up and attack you. As a kid, this is- Ah! Fuck! <laughs> yeah. Like that. As a kid, this is what scared me most, and even now, walking past the unconscious raptors still has me on edge. So the only surefire way to make sure these things are dead are to blow them the fuck up! Now, I'm all for adding new and refreshing gameplay elements to a game, as long as it's done so in a way that is well made and enjoyable. Sadly, that is not the case here, as the first person indoor segments, where you're realistically be spending most of the game, are neither well done or that much fun. While mixing up a top-down shooter and a first-person shooter was pretty cool and for the most part unheard of back in the day, especially for a Super Nintendo game, these segments run too slow, control far too poorly, which the lack of strafing doesn't help either, and feature enemies that are way too dumb and easy for these parts to be anything amazing. Hello! 
Goodbye. What the fuck? The only real threat of being damaged in these sections happens when you enter a room, and that's because your character has to find the enemies first. If, when you enter a room, you look to the left, but the enemy is actually to the right, then you'll get hit because it takes forever for your character to turn. The reason it takes so long, though, is because of how graphic heavy these parts are. While the visuals certainly are impressive for a game released in 1993, it comes at the cost of performance, which means that you're just getting hit because the SNES can't handle the graphics as well, not because a raptor outsmarted you. Hurting the player because of the limitations on a console isn't fair at all, and it just comes off as annoying after this happens for the hundredth time. In a vain attempt to make the game run a bit better, the screen was shrunken down for these parts, but unlike in other games like Stunt Race FX, where the screen is just shrunk down and given a lazy border, the border in this game is actually pretty creative, as it takes the shape of the goggles that the player is supposedly wearing. Not that the smaller screen improves the frame rate that much, but I can only imagine how slow this game would be if it was full screen. When you do eventually get used to how these parts play, there is a little bit of fun to be had. But any joy you'll experience comes to a screeching halt when you get to the computers. In order to escape from the park, you'll have to unlock gates, call for help, amongst a few other things, and all this is done by using computers scattered throughout the park. However, what makes this so frustrating is that some of these commands can only be done on certain computers. For example, when you're in the raptor pen and tasked with keeping the ship docked, you can't input the command from just any computer. No, it has to be a specific one. So you're forced to navigate through the familiar maze-like environments, hoping you don't get lost, just so you can use a computer that's the exact same as all the others. It all ends up being incredibly confusing, and it is bound to give you a headache, and when you have a headache, there's only one cure. System can't boot from this console? More like system can't blunt from this console. Ugh, 420, yeah! Oh shit, it's the cops! Ditch the bong! <laughs> However, there is one thing this game does perfectly, and that's the music. Holy shit, the music is catchy as all hell. So after five agonizing hours, I was finally able to call the mainland for help, but once I reached the helipad, the game informed me that I needed to collect more eggs. Why? For what purpose? In the first Jurassic Park game, you had to collect the eggs slash destroy them. A bit weird, but I'll let it slide seeing as how it was required to get the key cards in order to access the buildings and ultimately escape. But here, you can get to the end of the game, and if you don't have all the eggs and show up at the helipad, the guy's like, fuck you! get more eggs. You don't actually get anything for collecting the eggs in this game, and therefore they don't serve much purpose other than to make the game even more repetitive and last much longer than it should. And after all this is finally done, what's the ending you get? Pretty much just the intro, but in reverse, and then a short, stupid congratulations message. Really? I mean, come on. Even the Nintendo and Game Boy games had a better payoff than that. They both had a bit more of a detailed message and even a creative credits level. Here, you just get a reverse intro, a bland message, and then some out of place disco music. Alright, I admit, that last part's pretty cool. Overall, Jurassic Park for the Super Nintendo is a complete mess. It did a lot of clever things, but it's much too frustrating in a game that's way too cryptic and time consuming to be worth a playthrough. If you absolutely have to play this game, then do so on an emulator, so at the very least you can save your game, and make sure you use an online walkthrough. Doing these will slightly ease the pain. But for anyone wanting to have a fun time on the Super Nintendo, well, you'll have about as much fun here as a goat in a T-Rex enclosure. So in the year that the film came out, Nintendo saw two average Jurassic Park based games and one frustratingly painful one, albeit with amazing music. For Nintendo, it wouldn't be until a year later that there would be another Jurassic Park game, when Ocean decided to release a follow up for the Super Nintendo game, with the sequel being called Jurassic Park Part 2 The Chaos Continues. 
Now, with the Super Nintendo pretty much being my favorite console of all time, it goes without saying that I've played a good amount of games for it. So after pretty much seeing it all, it takes a lot for me to be impressed with any Super Nintendo games I've never played before. But when I first turned this game on, and then a couple hours later when I turned it on in a non-sexual way, I was really surprised. The game actually has a fully voiced intro animation. Ingen must be eliminated. I will have control of Jurassic Park. I was downright shocked when I played Super Metroid and heard a fully voiced sentence, but here, you get multiple sentences and some decently made animations. At the time, I can only imagine how amazing this was, and enough praise can't be given for the intro, even if at times it's a bit corny. Move and drop! Go! Go! While this is a sequel to the first Super Nintendo Jurassic Park game, its gameplay couldn't be any more different. You still play as Alan Grant, but while the first game was a blend of top-down shooting and first-person suffering, I mean, first-person shooting, this game is a side-scrolling shooter a la Contra or Mario. Well, that is if Mario went to Dinosaur Island with a gun. Mario, oh, oh, oh. you've been drinking again. You were shut up, a bitch. You don't get to talk to me like that. What? What are you doing? No, no! <laughs> Mamma mia! Despite the opening cutscene looking more like a children's cartoon, this is far from a children's game. Not because it's violent, but because it's fucking impossible. Now, don't get me wrong, I like difficulty in video games as long as it's counterbalanced with fairness. Games like Dark Souls are an excellent example of this, as there's usually some indication of what's next, be it through community messages or clues in the environment. But this game is just pure difficulty with none of the fairness. Unless you know where enemies are gonna pop up or have the reaction time of a ninja, then you're just gonna have to shoot your gun every few steps you take. Oh God. Oh God, what have I done? Why? I didn't see you! What it all comes down to is remembering where enemies are and what's up next, which is fine for a game that sends you back to a recent checkpoint if you mess up and die, but the game doesn't do that. This makes it very difficult to come up with a plan of action when you're at a hard part or facing a boss, because you won't want to experiment and try new tactics, seeing as how if you mess up, you get sent back to the beginning of the level. And the absence of checkpoints really is a crippling factor, as there's no shortage of unfair parts in this game. Like, really? How is this fair? I'm dealing with a T-Rex chasing me, and then this happens? The only reason I was able to pass this part is because I was able to go back in my footage and see that once I passed 14 guys in the trees, the drop-off would happen. But the game would much rather have the player fail constantly and go through the whole level again and again instead of just being fair and giving the player a heads up. I mean, any indication at all from the driver would have been nice, but nope, he's calm as all hell and even content with driving off the cliff. Mission complete? How is this a mission complete? The driver's dead, the T-Rex is still loose, I'd hardly call that a job well done. At least the game gives you the option of choosing the levels in any order you want, so you're not stuck on just any one level in particular. Some of these levels have you fighting dinosaurs, while others have you killing people for some reason. Now, brutally murdering dozens of people doesn't seem very Dr. Grant-like to me, but maybe he's just sick and tired of starring in all these games. Regardless of whatever level you pick though, they all have a few things in common. They each begin with a mission briefing informing you on what to expect and what to do. Protect the Galapagos? Don't worry, I'm a pro at that! Well, you know what lying to me gets ya? A bunch of dead Galapagos. You happy, you asshole? Another thing the levels have in common is a focus on the hope that the park will eventually reopen. 
At the top of the screen is a number which indicates the amount of dinosaurs left on the island. Kill too many that aren't raptors or T-Rex and you lose as the park will not be able to reopen. To deal with this, you're given two sets of weapons, weapons that kill and weapons meant to stun. Though, how exactly some of the non-lethal weapons don't kill the dinosaurs is beyond me. Alright, I just gotta very carefully... Yeah, I did it! For all the things the game does wrong, this stands out as a really original idea and makes for an interesting enough gameplay element that actually in the grand scheme of things, works. The developers even went as far as allowing natural reproduction to play a role in the game, making it so after a while, more dinosaurs are added to the counter. It's just a shame that great ideas like this weren't universal to the game as a whole. However, something that is universal in this game are the shitty item placements. Unlike the first game, this game at least tells you that you're gonna get health, but nine times out of 10, that health is placed so far out of the way that by the time you get to it, you've taken so much damage that the whole point of actually getting the health is ruled obsolete. And health is incredibly crucial in this game, seeing as how it also suffers from off-screen enemy respawn syndrome. And what does this mean? Well, the second the camera moves back to where an enemy will spawn, they appear. And this becomes a huge problem when an enemy comes at you from behind, because you have to turn around and kill him. But when you face forward again, he'll just spawn right back. If there also happens to be an enemy in front of you, then the same rule applies, and it doesn't take too long for the game to just turn into a complete clusterfuck. Excuse me, uh, has anyone seen my soul? No, 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 a lot of this can be attributed to sloppy programming on Ocean's part. And if you're not convinced the programming could have used a bit more touching up, then tell that to this raptor who just fell through the ground. Or this one. Or hell, just say it to me, cause God knows it happened to me enough times. It should also be noted that the company has no plans to patch these glitches. Speaking of the raptors, whoever programmed their AI must have never seen the infamous scene in the first movie where Robert Muldoon says clever girl because the raptors here are far from clever. In fact, a lot of them just seem incompetent. They pretty much react to what buttons you press, regardless of if they're near you or not, even if this results in their death. It's hilarious to see, but it doesn't exactly make for much of a fun time. Yo, man, I'm late. What I miss? Eh, nothing much. Just killed a velociraptor. Shit, dog, how you do that? I just stood up and he jumped off a cliff. No big deal. Pretty much the most important things in a game, whether it be difficulty, enemy and item placement, or it's programming, is done so poorly here that it makes for a game that is truly a horrible time. To this game, I have only one thing left to say. In the words of Alan Grant, after careful consideration, I have decided not to endorse your part. A month later in December of 1994, the game also saw a release on the Game Boy, but in name only. While the previous Game Boy game was pretty much a port of its console counterpart, this version is completely different compared to its console brethren. And well, unlike the Super Nintendo version, it's greatly paced, has a fair difficulty, and is really fun to play. Made by Ocean, Jurassic Park Part 2, The Chaos Continues to the Game Boy, has you playing as Alan Grant. Again, as you shoot your way through 15 levels while you wait for it, collect stuff to move on. All so you can ultimately escape from Jurassic Park for what seems like the 80th time. Why does he keep coming back? In terms of gameplay, it's still a side-scrolling shooter, but unlike the SNES version, this game's run-and-gun gameplay is actually complemented by its level design and it is also made significantly better thanks to the enemies actually being placed in smart locations. There's a certain charm to traverse in each level that wasn't really seen in any of Ocean's previous Jurassic Park games. Whether it's jumping on hovering leaves or riding on a boat dodging air mines, the game is, simply put, really enjoyable. That being said, how your character shoots could have been improved. Killing enemies sometimes prove difficult as time after time, I found myself having trouble with hitting any enemy that came at me from an angle. 
seeing as how the only way your character can aim diagonal is to move at the same time, which can lead to you taking unnecessary damage. As if to mock the player, your character will actually aim diagonal when he's in his idle animation. This serves no purpose as the second you shoot, he just shoots forward. You do have grenades which are thrown in an arc and allow you to hit some of these enemies more easily, but due to their short range, they aren't all that effective. Aside from that though, the game controls perfectly. What would normally be painstakingly difficult jump in other games weren't actually all that difficult in this game thanks to its solid and tight controls. What helps to keep this game even more fun are the varying situations your character will be put in that change up how the game is played, like the previously mentioned riding on the boat. But there's also boss battles, swimming sections, and chase sequences in which you run away from a t- OH MY GOD WHAT THE F- Fuck is that? That thing's horrifying looking. Is that really what the T-Rex looks like in this game? That's fucking gross. The character of Ellie Sattler looked more attractive than that. Shit, even Dennis Niji looked better. With those luscious lips and that. A massive body. Speaking of looks, graphically, for a Game Boy game, this game looks great. Minus the T-Rex, the graphics are charming, the animations are smooth, and the backgrounds vary enough from level to level to make things feel different. However, sometimes the backgrounds can actually work against the game. Although certainly not a game breaker, it can sometimes be difficult to differentiate what's part of the background and what's not. You'll get to some parts that look like you can actually pass an area when you really can't, or or make it look like you can't pass when you really can. Like in this level where I thought this was a locked door and so I spent a good 15 minutes looking for anything that I may have missed. But all it turned out to be was a pipe in the background. This problem didn't pop up too often, but when it did, it was pretty frustrating. Now, for all the things the game does right, it did feature one annoying problem that unlike the other problems isn't as easily overlooked. During the chase sequences, you're frequently given two paths to choose from in order to escape from the T-Rex. My problem with this is that if you pick the wrong one, then you sometimes aren't given enough time to pick the correct one, as you'll most likely be killed by the T-Rex. Killing a player in a game shouldn't be decided on a luck-based choice, as it serves no challenge and isn't fun. You could be amazing at video games and still die just because you picked the wrong path. In a game that otherwise features great design choices, this stands out as a really bad one. So, after making your way through 14 levels, murdering both dinosaurs and exotic fish, and collecting a shit ton of pass cards, you finally get to the last boss, and why the fuck is this T-Rex so less ugly than the other one? It's not too challenging a boss fight, in fact, it's exploitable as all hell, but the levels leading up to it are challenging enough that an easy last boss fight isn't too big of a deal. Once you beat the T-Rex, you're treated to a good looking cutscene and a word for word end message from the first two games because I guess the only keys working on their keyboards were Control c and Control v That's a copy and paste joke. <laughs> In the end, I was surprised with how much fun I actually had with this game. Maybe it's because Ocean's previous four attempts were either only average or painful Painful. But whatever the case may be, if you're looking for a fun Game Boy game or just an entertaining game in general, then I really recommend that you give this game a try. It sort of fit in that the end into Ocean's first Jurassic Park game would be the end into this one, as the next game for a Nintendo system wasn't made by Ocean at all. Instead, the job was given to Taurus Games. However, the next game in the series, Jurassic Park The Lost World for the Game Boy, wouldn't come out until three years later in December of 1997, the same year as the second movie of the same name. In Jurassic Park The Lost World, you play as Alan Grant. You know, Alan Grant. The same one in all the other games? The one that isn't in the second movie at all and only briefly mentioned in the second book? Yeah, that guy. Your goal is to collect stuff in the game's eight levels so you can escape the island before it's blown to shit, killing all the dinosaurs and people left there. The first thing you'll most likely notice about the game is that it feels weird for a Game Boy game. It feels as if it's a port of a console version similar to how other Game Boy games, such as Aladdin, Toy Story, and Lion King do. The game contains a lot of frames of animation and even some impressive cutscenes which seem a little bit too ambitious 
to build from the ground up for a Game Boy game. But to my knowledge, this game isn't a port. This isn't bad or anything, I just find it a bit odd and worth mentioning. As with most of the other games, you'll have to collect a lot in this game, whether it be floppy disks, DNA samples, or eggs, but at least there's a bit of variety this time around, so it's not all that bad. But Jesus Christ, again with the eggs? Hasn't Alan done that enough already? And this time around, the game really wants you to get eggs, even asking you to go and steal T-Rex eggs. To my surprise though, the game eventually gets self-aware of how annoying collecting eggs is and gives the player this message. If you bring us these last 10 eggs, I promise we will never ask for another egg again? Collecting things in this game can be a bit difficult though thanks to the slippery controls, but it also doesn't help that Alan moves around at inhuman speeds. In fact, he controls more like a super powered robot than he does a human, seeing as how he can jump 50 feet into the air doing front flips and even punch a dinosaur so hard that it explodes. Twice. Though annoying at first, these awkward controls are something that you eventually get used to around the second or third level, so it's not the end of the world. Despite the fact that your character's bare fists can cause a dinosaur to explode, you're gonna want to be using the other weapons at your disposal, like the pistol, is shooting the dinosaurs helping the park yet, and grenades, is blowing up the dinosaurs helping the park yet. Both have their own advantages and disadvantages, but unlike the previous game, the grenade actually comes in handy a lot more this time around. Now, you can change the distance it's thrown by holding the attack button. This is extremely useful when you're up against some of the game's harder enemies. The enemies you'll come across vary from both humans who will shoot at you, to bats, plants, and dinosaurs who will knock into you in order to do damage, sometimes with hilarious results. Stop, 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 motherfucker. Peace out. So majestic. The game's more difficult enemies, however, are the raptors. They do a lot of damage, and if you're unlucky enough to be hit by one, it's very difficult to escape. But for some strange reason, the raptors are actually more dangerous than the T-Rex are. Every T-Rex you encounter is incredibly small and easy to escape from, making them pose very little threat. So you're a T-Rex? Well, Nintendo's taught me that you're not much more powerful than a raptor. Even more dangerous than the raptors though are the underwater segments. For the most part, they aren't all that bad except for one major problem. If your character is underwater for too long, then they start to take damage. If you could swim from one section to another without partially drowning, then these sections would work, but that isn't the case here. Most of these parts are so long that your character would take damage by the time they get to the end. The game tries to make up for this by adding health pickups at the end of these sections, but if you're gonna do that, then why not just add air pockets? Did nobody test these levels? If you're low on health and you come to one of these sections, then you will drown, and this is a huge possibility, as you'll be doing a lot of backtracking since you may miss one of the items you need to collect. Also, your air bubbles float out of the water. Wait, what? Overall, Taurus Games did a lot better than most of Ocean's Jurassic Park games. They even included a password system, something all the other Jurassic Park games lacked. Though not as good as Part 2 on the Game Boy, you can definitely tell there was a good amount of effort put into this game, as it has a lot going for it. Great graphics, interesting enemies, and most importantly, the promise of no more eggs. Definitely worth a try if you're looking for a solid Jurassic adventure. Although Nintendo would have a fair amount of Jurassic Park games released in the future for its systems, The Lost World concluded Nintendo's participation in another Jurassic Park game for the remainder of the 90s. In doing so, they left us with two average games, a cryptic mess, a frustratingly difficult and plain shooter, and two actually good games. But Chris, what about Sega? Didn't Sega have a lot of Jurassic Park games? Well, that's a review for another time. Mainly because I don't own any of them. There we go. Finally finished. Whew. 
Now I can finally get some rest. Come in. Hey, Chris. I need you to stop at the store and get me a dozen eggs, okay? Aw, oh, son of a bitch! Hey everybody, my name's Chris Jouette, and I hope you enjoyed this video. It took me a while to make, so a like, comment, and subscription would mean a lot to me. It'd also mean a lot if you checked out Jason Stevens, who did the intro voice. You can check him out by clicking his link in the description below. I'm also sure the dude who made the intro animation, Freddy Sal, would also enjoy if you checked out his channel, Freddy Sal Animations. If you want to be among the coolest people on earth, then you can support me on Patreon. But, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go and get some eggs. So, until next time. Are we having fun yet?